Well, good morning. Wonderful to see everyone this morning. We're starting a little late, so uh, I'm just going to talk real fast. Uh, let's begin, as is our practice, with prayer. Father, we thank you that you have brought us together uh, and that you have, through your Son, challenged us to be a people who are in relationship with you, who call you by your power names, and who also call you Father. Um, we thank you that you have given us the challenge of praying your kingdom into existence. Would you open our minds and hearts as we consider today what that means and how it challenges us to be truly your people. It's through your son that we pray. Amen. So, this is the one I was looking forward to. <laughs> it, it, uh, and of course, now that we've gotten to this day, I'm looking forward to a couple more that we're going to do uh, a couple weeks down the road that um, I'm, I'm just amazed at the depth of five little verses, but in the hands of the master of the universe, uh, these five verses contain so much stuff. Um, it's, it's really quite amazing. So we're going to begin uh, today with the phrase, hallowed be thy name. Uh, to hallow is one of those words, uh, and in the adjective form, something is hallowed. One of those words that fell out of favor in the English language for a number of years. It's interesting to look back at the King James, which uses hallow or hallowed, uh, I think 33 times in the Old Testament. And... Um, you look at the uh, American Standard Version, 1901, uh, has virtually all of those references from the King James uh, in it. But by the time we get to the Revised Standard in the late 40s, uh, almost all references to hallowed or hallow uh, go away in favor of uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, okay, as opposed to hallow it. Uh, and it's, it's interesting how our, our language uh, moves in and out of favor. Hallowed, it turns out, is coming back. Uh, the new revised uh, version, which came out in the mid-80s, uh, has a, a number of hallowed references, but it's really interesting. Those two words, hallowed, uh, and the two instances, uh, in every translation, starting with the King James and right on through, uh, in the New Testament, those are the only two times that the, those words are used. Uh, Matthew 6, uh, with the model prayer within the context of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Luke 11, within the context of Lord teach us to pray as, uh, as John taught his disciples. Only two uh, references where it gets translated that way in the English. The words are the same, and the words are used many times uh, in the Greek, but for some reason, we have hallowed that word hallow <laughs> so that it is connected directly with what the religious world thinks of as, as the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and, and we've set it apart for that purpose. And, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, for a definition, there's two forms of the word. There's an active version to make something holy. Uh, and there's a passive version to honor something as being holy. And uh, so the context of uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, in the Gettysburg Address, uh, we, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. And he's saying that because no matter what feeble efforts the people who are gathered on the, on the Gettysburg battlefield make, it has already been sanctified, made holy, uh, in political terms at least, uh, by the battle that occurred and the people who lost their lives there. Um, it's, it, it is interesting, we, we have a, a British author that I think maybe is bringing that, uh, uh, that word hallowed uh, back. Uh, some, uh, let's see, uh, Potter I think is the last name. Harley? Harvey? Harry, that's it, Harry Potter, yeah. And, and the Deathly Hallows. And, and suddenly our, our, uh, our contemporary culture says, ooh, magic, I think I like hallowing. Well, this is not going to be anything about uh, magic uh, or Harry Potter, uh, but it does, uh, it does call us to use the word correctly and then to think about what it means in our lives. Logan, go ahead. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. The, yes. Yes. The evening before All Saints Day on November 1st is the hallowed even which we have shortened gradually to Halloween and completely <laughs> taken it off in, in new directions. Uh, but yes, the same, the same word there and, and the same context. We're going to, the, the next day is so important to us religiously that we're going to set aside the night before uh, and, and make it something special and something holy. So let's take a look at the uh, examples that we have in the, in the Bible of hallowing something begins in Genesis 2. By the way, I'm, I'm quoting here from the New Revised uh, Version because it uses the word hallow or hallowed uh, more frequently than the New American, which is what I usually uh, use. On the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. So God does the initial hallowing. He can, by definition, make something holy. And so he looks at the seven days and he says, the seventh day I'm going to set aside, I am going to rest, and in modeling that rest, I'm going to show uh, the people that I'm creating how to hallow something. From this point on, it's interesting, we're going to see people more heavily involved in the hallowing process. Go to Leviticus, the 16th chapter. Then he, that's the high priest, uh, shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement on its behalf and shall take some of the blood of the bull and the blood of the goat and put it on each of the horns of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his fingers seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. So here we have... The high priest, the one whom God has designated as the go-between, the, the one who's going to bring God's people into relationship with God. And his first job is to make sure that the uncleanness of the people, including his own personal uncleanness, uh, does not unhallow uh, the altar. And so there's a sprinkling of blood to, to cleanse the altar from the people's uncleannesses now the people can approach and uh, offer sacrifice and have their sins uh, forgiven. Uh, further in Leviticus, you shall hallow the 50th year and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all of its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return every one of you to your property and every one of you to your family. What a joyful day that would be. Imagine that you've fallen on economic hard times, not hard for some of us to imagine, and and, and you've, you've done what needed to be done, and you've sold the family homestead, and you've said goodbye to all those memories, and now it's come around to the Jubilee year. Get it all back, and it's debt-free. You can start over. You can get a fresh start. What a wonderful celebration that would be. Uh, interesting point, I think, wasn't it John Partlow that brought this up, that... Uh, uh, we don't have any scriptural uh, examples of the Jubilee year ever being celebrated. It may have been. Uh, we just don't know. Uh, but given the nature of the people of God during that time, we, of course, are much better uh, than those people. But uh, during that time, I, I can see how the, the Jubilee year might not have been hallowed in the way God wanted it to be done. Uh, but proclaim liberty. This is an active isn't this great? God has intervened in our lives. God is setting everything right. God is setting us up for a fresh start and a new beginning, uh, and we are going to hallow that experience. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, 20th chapter, I, the Lord, am your God. Follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances and hallow my Sabbaths, that they may be a sign between me and you so that you may know that I, the Lord, am your God. This is in the context of a, a larger indictment of the people. Ezekiel says, this is what God has been telling you all along, hallow my Sabbaths, but you have not been hallowing my Sabbaths. As a result, you're going to have some hard times. Um, so uh, in all of this, you see how 
God is the one who makes things holy, but we can make things that he has made holy, holy, or we can profane them. And that brings us to um, the, uh, the idea of our being challenged to hallow uh, God's name. Uh, King James has 33 uses of hallow or hallowed in the Old Testament, but it, on, it joins all the contemporary versions in only using the word hallow as the uh, chosen translation uh, in the two model prayers, uh, Matthew 6 and Luke 11. So, hallowed be thy name. Can we, God's people, forgiven, continually cleansed, can we hallow God's name? Or are we merely saying that it is hallowed, affirming, if you will, making an intellectual assent to the idea that God has hallowed his name? Go ahead. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Logan's point is to say that something is holy is to talk about a state of being. Okay? To hallow something is to actively set it apart. And so we hallow God's name simply by saying that, but also in our actions. Am I saying what you want to say? Okay. Uh, so. Th- Thank you, Logan, for setting us off. Now we've got all kinds of hands. Uh, Carlin, go ahead. Yes. And that's a very Jewish uh, thought right there. Uh, from, from, the, from the Jewish perspective, all through the, the rabbinic period, after they've come back from Babylonian captivity and they're beginning to think about how they can build a fence around the law, make sure they don't ever end up in Babylonian captivity again. Uh, One of the thoughts is God is so other, God is so different, God is so God, um, and and we are not, that uh, only God is in a position of doing these things, and and we are going to affirm uh, his holiness. We are going to protect that holiness as much as we can, don't use God's name in vain. We'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But, but there's, a, there's a kind of a God's already done this, so it's, it's kind of superfluous for me to get involved in hallowing his name. Uh, but that's, that's a good translation of what's going on here. Yes, ma'am. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Beth's observation is that hallowing his name verbally is the equivalent of a verbal bow, to bow before God, who is, by the way, asking to be addressed as Father, and yet is still God in all of his greatness and all of his power and all of his holiness. So to bow, to prostrate oneself, uh, would be highly appropriate. Uh, for us, and, uh, and, and so that, that becomes a part of hallowing then, is to, is to recognize the otherness, the he's God and we aren't. <laughs> we may think we might like to be God, we, we even make movies about uh, what happens when somebody accidentally becomes God or becomes empowered by him to do the things that God can do, uh, but in, in the final analysis, we don't have the equipment to be God, okay? So bowing before him and saying, may your name be hallowed, uh, is, is an appropriate response. Okay? Ben, you had a comment? Mm-hmm. Excellent. Mm 
-hmm. Excellent, excellent. Ben's observation is that uh, the act of hallowing his name is an act of lifting his name up above all other names. In fact, we sing a song about Jesus, name above all names, right? Uh, and so th th the process of hallowing is in fact a process of differentiating his name uh, above all others. So excellent observations. Did I see another hand? Yeah, Ernie? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the judgment day attitude will be one of recognizing, right? Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah, uh, to the glory of God the Father, I think is the rest of the, of the verse. Um, everyone will hallow his name. The question is, are we going to do it uh, during our lifetimes and thus change our lives accordingly, or are we going to try to maintain control of our lives and discover uh, only uh, when it's too late that, uh, that we are going to confess and we are going to hallow uh, his name? Uh, what's the difference between not using his name in vain and hallowing his name? Is that, is that a distinction that we can make? What do we think of when we think of not using God's name in vain? Okay. Don't use it in an oath or a curse. Okay. How about if we're just kind of using it as a, well, it's, it's become commonplace, right? OMG, we've got an abbreviation for it. Um, I'm not really taking an oath and I'm not really cursing, but am I using it in the way it was intended to be used? The answer is no, certainly not. So, so that's kind of a negative way of looking at it. Don't use God's name in vain. And it, clearly it's important because God made it one of the Ten Commandments, right? But what's the difference between that and actively hallowing his name? I have a, had a hand over here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, boy. Now you're really opening a can of worms. Yeah, good old Dennis is always going to, yeah. Uh, Dennis asks, what about when you're taking a, an oath uh, on the witness stand to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you. And, of course, we have uh, ways of, of working around that within the legal system, don't we? You can affirm this without taking an oath if you are not an oath taker. And uh, so that, that all gets worked out. But that is an excellent point. There's an opportunity to use God's name in the way it was intended to be used in an oath, right? I promise and I invoke God's name in that promise. And that's biblical. Now, is that what Jesus said for us to do? Jesus was pretty clear about not taking an oath. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And that's why religious people uh, through the years have looked at that oath-taking process and say, don't we have another way that we, could, that we could do this? Mary, did you have your hand up? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Once upon a time, awesome actually meant something, and and then a car company came along, and somehow or another, their their voiceover announcer on their television commercials managed to get about four syllables out of awesome. It's awesome, you know. And from then on, the the word has been worthless uh, within within religious contexts. Do we serve an awesome God? Does he inspire awe in the, <laughs> in the eyes of anyone who comes in contact with him? And yet we've lost a word by which we can <laughs> set, that, uh, set that name apart and, and make it holy and hallowed. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we've, we've come to use reverend as an honorific almost for, for all kinds of humans and 
And then it loses its context for being able to say, holy and reverend uh, is, is his name. And the, uh, the, the, the loss of our language, that's an interesting thought. I hadn't, hadn't thought about that until you just brought that up. The loss of words by which we can hallow God's name. It's a pretty significant loss. Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Oh, certainly not. Certainly not. Yeah. 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 And clearly, Jesus doesn't have any, any idea in mind of excluding our uh, pledging allegiance to the God who has sent his son to save us. Uh, Larry's point is that, that when we are baptized, we make a confession there that's very much uh, in the form of, of an oath, uh, and, th and that confession is not only appropriate, it's required. Uh, and so the, the process of, of excluding oath-taking uh, should not uh, you know, spill over into our relationship with our God. Uh, at the same time, it's easy to extend oath-taking out. And, and by the way, in Jesus' time, what he was talking about was you could take an oath uh, that, was, that took the form of a contract. I promise you that I'm going to do this, this, and this, uh, in return for which you're going to do that, that, and that. And it was not unusual at all in the, in the religious world of the time uh, to take one of their God's names uh, and connect it to that oath. Uh, Jews, of course, would only have connected Yahweh's name to that oath, and Jesus is saying this is not an appropriate use of God's name. Uh, whether you follow through on your business commitments or not uh, is not within God's purview or God's power, although we certainly hope that you will follow through on your business commitments. Uh, but that's, the, those are, we, we want to make sure that we don't exclude activities that are religiously appropriate while also not doing the things that Jesus has told us not to do. Uh, quickly, Ben, and then we're going to move on. Yeah, truly uh, the, the miracles, both Old Testament and New Testament, Ben's referencing specifically Elijah's uh, uh, offering with the, with the prophets of Baal, and uh, they, you know, they pray over theirs all day long and still can't get a light, and, uh, and then uh, he, he takes his sacrifice, makes it impossible to light, and uh, that's awesome. <laughs> now that is awesome power. Uh, Somehow a, a 240Z car just doesn't quite compare uh, to that. And, and yet we do have a tendency to smuggle religious power into our world and, and use it in places it's not supposed to be used. Uh, uh, we're back to uh, Harry Potter and the, and the Deathly Hallows, although that meant something entirely different in that context. So difference between using God's name in vain and hallowing his name is one of what you don't do versus what you do do. And that, uh, that is, is something that I'm not sure I have spent enough time thinking about in my own life. In what way am I in my life today <laughs> hallowing God's name? Okay? Yes, go ahead. Mm-hmm. 
it's really easy, isn't it, to, because we have a God who calls us to call him father, to kind of make him dad. And, oh yeah, he's there when I need him. He, he's got the keys to the car and it's always gassed up and I can take it out for a date and, you know, to kind of lower that whole thing down. And that's, that's a large part of the tension that we, I think, are supposed to feel as Christians. We have a familial relationship. We have an intimate relationship with God. And yet, <laughs> he is still our Father who's in heaven. And we are still very earthbound and very prone to not living heavenly lives, not living lives that hallow his name. And so the, the gulf there has been spanned uh, by our Lord and Savior, but the gulf is still clearly visible, at least in my life. <laughs> I can sure see uh, a gap between what I should be okay, and what I actually am. And, uh, and so th that brings us to what happens in our lives when we hallow God's name. What do I have to change about who I am and how I act in order to hallow God's name? And then we're going to have to cut it off because I've still got the kingdom to go, <laughs> right? What do we have to change in, in order to hallow God's name? Ben, go ahead. Excellent. Excellent. Having a certain degree of humility <laughs> before God, we, we live in a world that thinks they can explain anything, and we can fall into that trap as well. Oh, yeah, we know how that works. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, here, you want me to explain the Trinity? No problem at all. Here, let me show you how it works. I got an egg here with a shell and a yolk and a... No, that's, that's, that's way, way oversimplifying. And so to a certain extent... We hallow God's name by recognizing that we cannot get our arms completely around it, okay? And, and we, we recognize that as being a part of raising his name up and making it holy, making it other, making it truly God's and truly not ours, except as God has called us into relationship. Terry, go. Excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent.
Excellent. And, and that's, that's good words to, to part this section on it. When, when you use God's name, you better mean it. And, uh, and if you mean it, it's because you are saying something about God or something to God as opposed to just invoking his name uh, for whatever other purposes. Uh, not saying his name is very Jewish, uh, and, and that, they did that on purpose, to avoid using his name in vain. Uh, but the process of knowing when to use his name and using God's name judiciously is probably a good way to wrap that up. Let's get to the kingdom, because I don't want to give it short uh, shrift. Uh, thy kingdom come. Wow. Now there's, <laughs> there's three words that will cause arguments all over the religious world, right? I grew up in churches of Christ that taught that we could no longer pray that because his kingdom had come on the day of Pentecost. And so that was a done deal. No reason to pray for his kingdom to come uh, in, in any uh, future way because it was already here. Uh, now, that was also at the same time when every uh, person in the Church of Christ that I knew uh, was a dispensationalist. Uh, so they, they had a, a, a fairly complex interpretive scheme for the Revelation that involved setting apart different dispensations and a clearly demarked line between the dispensation before Jesus' ministry and the dispensation after Jesus. Jesus' ministry, and, and that was part of that thought process. Thy kingdom come is no longer uh, appropriate. Uh, let's, let's take a look quickly at some scriptural references, and then we'll make a decision as to whether we want to do a both-and uh, definition on that. Uh, Exodus 19, uh, Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me, look at this language, a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Are we going to hear that term ever again in the Bible? That's going to just be a recurring theme, right? A priestly kingdom and a holy nation. Second Samuel, this is Samuel conveying God's words to the newly anointed King David. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Any question as to whether this is an eternal kingdom? No. How well has that worked for the earthly kingdom of David? Worked pretty well through David's era. Uh, Solomon kind of ran on the impetus of, of David. The forward motion carried Solomon through his uh, kingdom. And after that, it kind of, the wheels kind of, kind of came off the wagon there. You can see how, and, and John's doing a great job, John Fernandez is doing a great job on Wednesday nights of looking at Malachi and the difference between how God's people viewed themselves in Malachi and how God viewed them. God starts that book out by saying, I have loved you, and his, and his people are saying, how have you loved us? Take a look at us. Have you seen us recently? We're rebuilding from having been completely wiped out. The temple that we have is just a, a, a ghost of what it once was. It doesn't have anything like the, how, how have you blessed us? How have you loved us? That's the Jews' response uh, to that, um, that statement of God. From God's perspective, I punished you because you needed punishing. That's an act of love. That's what parents do for children. And I brought you back. I gave you a second start. I gave you a do-over. That's true love. That's how parents raise healthy, uh, godly children is by showing them how certain things don't work and then giving them another chance to, to apply God's word to their lives. From God's perspective, he had been deeply loving. From the people's perspective, he had left them alone and kind of let them down, okay? Uh, so uh, your house and your kingdom will last forever, but don't think that you know what that means necessarily at this point, all right? Psalm 145, all your works uh, shall give thanks to you, O Lord. Your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom, talk of your power, uh, to make known uh, to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. Uh, I'm not even going to read the one you all know, that unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Uh, and uh, eternal father, prince of peace, no end to the increase of his government. 
We show up in Matthew. Uh, at the time of John the Baptist, Jesus begins preaching and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right on the doorstep, okay? And our tendency in thinking in the, the black and white either or terms that we tend to think is to say, oh, isn't that great? Jesus is, is saying, just you wait. The kingdom is just almost here, right? What Jesus is actually saying there is the door is open and the kingdom is standing on your front porch, okay? It's here now. And you're just kind of starting to open your eyes and see what's going to happen in this eternal kingdom. So we don't want to get too black and white. Has he been crucified yet? No, he hasn't. Well, then the kingdom hasn't come, okay? Has, have the, the Pentecost experience, has that happened yet? No, it hasn't. Well, then the kingdom hasn't come. The kingdom is in the process of coming, and it is still in the process of coming. We'll talk about that in a minute. Jesus, of course, talks about this when, when he's challenged about uh, how he casts out demons. You, you cast out demons by the prince of demons. Jesus says, that doesn't make any sense. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. It's here. It's now. It's happening. It's just a question of whether you want to be a part of it or not. And that's what that's Jesus challenged the religious authorities of his day. As we all know, that didn't work out all that well for the religious authorities of his day. Finally, Revelation 1, Jesus talking to uh, John and revealing what he's going to reveal to John. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us, here's that theme again, he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when we pray thy kingdom come, we are talking about something that has happened. Jesus announced it. Jesus was the fulfillment of it. Jesus brought the new kingdom. Jesus revigorated and, uh, and raised from the dead the Davidic kingdom. And, uh, and so that is fait accompli. And yet, if you're living in our world, how much does it look like his will? I'm not getting ahead of myself. This is next week. Uh, his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Is that happening? Yeah? Okay. Not all over. No, just take a look around you. You can see that that's, that's not yet true. Logan and then Carlin, go ahead. Yes. That's a, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? The kingdom is, is here, and people are forcing their way into the kingdom. This is, a, this is a revolutionary idea. And, of course, that was what made Herod nervous, right? <laughs> uh, not only Herod, but if, if uh, uh, Augustus had known what was happening uh, down there in Bethlehem, he'd have been nervous, too, and, and rightly so. The Roman kingdom seemed like it was eternal, but it wasn't. Uh, the heavenly kingdom did not seem like it was eternal, the, the Davidic kingdom, and yet here it comes, and we're forcing our way into it. Carlin? Uh-huh. The kingdom of God is among you. They're asking future tense. When will the kingdom come? And he says... <laughs> Have you looked around? <laughs> it's happening. But it is happening on an ongoing basis. And we're going to run out of time here. Sir. Uh-huh. That is a paraphrase. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, Larry's point is that the kingdom ultimately is going to be in heaven, and there's no question that that's, that's true. At the same time, this is a celebration of the kingdom, is it not? Okay, A kingdom already here and being forced into <laughs> by people as they, as they come and, and realize that this is where the real power is, this is where eternal life lies, uh, so it, it's a once and future 
kingdom. That's a literary way of, of putting that, and, and uh, we're, we're just going to have to wrap it up here. What will his kingdom look like when it's fully realized? Will we have people all around us who are not doing God's will when the kingdom is fully realized? No. Here's the real question, and it gets to what Larry just observed. Will this ever happen on earth? And uh, I want to just leave you with that challenge to think about because we've, we've had an orthodoxy, uh, and, and we're not alone in this. There's, there's all kinds of pe people in the religious world who've developed an orthodoxy. I know that the kingdom is going to take this form, and it's going to be in this place and at this time, and because I know that, I don't ever think about it. And I just want to challenge you to think about uh, the, the final couple of chapters, 20 and 20, or 21 and 22 of Revelation, where the kingdom of heaven comes down as a bride prepared for her husband, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to earth. There are ways in which this is going to happen on earth. It is not going to probably be fully fulfilled on earth, but our challenge as God's people is to make it happen in our own lives, within our own orbit, our own circle of people that we influence, to make that happen so that, in fact, next week's lesson, his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's close with prayer. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You get a little preview of Art's prayer here in just, in just a, a moment. He's going to pray a kingdom prayer that's very appropriate given what we're talking about. And yes, are we truly in the kingdom? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I, I, think that's what, I think that's what we're reading about. And that language is pure Paul. That's a quotation from Paul uh, that, that we are, we've been translated out of this world into the new world. We're not going to go off to the desert uh, and, and have a, a, a separating experience. We're still in the world, but not of the world. There's another Pauline concept. Now we've really got to pray because we're late. Father, we thank you that you have challenged us uh, to think about what it means to be in the kingdom what it means to be your people, what it means to make your name holy, what it means to model the power that is in this world right now as a result of your son. It's through his name that we pray. Amen.